Welcome to Tell Me Your Story, New Paradigms for a New World. I'm Richard Dugan, your host. I have to say it every single program. Thank you for joining us. Whether you're watching us on uh, our podcast sites, whether you're listening to the radio broadcast, whether you are watching us on uh, YouTube, those are the uh, places we have podcasts, video casts, and broadcasts. Thank you for taking time to listen to this program uh, to hopefully maybe get some new ideas or be reminded of old ideas that, uh, you know, that you forgot all about. And uh, we're just kind of, you know, uh, giving you uh, some clues and tapping that memory of yours. Uh, it's, uh, it's a great pleasure to always come your way on this program. I've been doing this for, oh my goodness, Oh, I think it's getting close to 40, 79 and three and uh, yeah, 44 years. I've been doing this. They've been in this business, been doing this program. Uh, we're coming up on our 15th anniversary. We're in. And if you calculate it correctly, that's correct. We are in our 15th year. We'll celebrate the end of that on September 7th of this year. It's really exciting to uh, think about. I'm really into milestones and, of course, as you folks know, patterns and things of this nature. It's actually kind of fun. Well, today's program is uh, no less interesting and fun because we're going to look into some patterns, some things that you might have heard about. Uh, you might have even investigated yourself, and we hope you have. We're going to be talking with uh, Amy uh, Robeson, and we're going to be talking about um, the Akashic Records and the work that she does surrounding that. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, how to awaken to the limitless possibilities. Where? Well, where else? Within you. Okay. And it's always been that way. And Amy Robeson, thank you so much for joining us here on the program. It's really nice to have you here. Thank you for having me and congratulations on your 15th year of doing this show. That's awesome. I love it. Well, I'll tell you, I can't, I, I mean, I could sit here and do the math as to how many folks we've interviewed over the years. Um, not to mention the program, the, the interviews that I've done prior to uh, starting Tell Me Your Story in 2007. Uh, but, um, uh, and, and actually that's interesting how the, I didn't even think about this at the time. Um, but 2007, September 7th, a couple of sevens there. I guess that was a, an auspicious date. I'll have to check with my Vedic astrologer on that one. <laughs> you, you, uh, have, um, a website, which of course we're going to give folks that website, the Amy Robeson.com T H E A M Y R O B E S O N.com. We will be linked to your website as well. And uh, you you help people through the process of looking at their um, at their Akashic records about what it is really kind of what we've been talking about on this program, what it is that makes them who they are. Is that uh, and it, and that is, is supposed to help them uh, to understand better, accept who they are better. And then let all of that concern over those thoughts that they had prior so that they can get on with not only their life's purpose, but thriving in their life. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah. And, and so much more. The, the records are such an amazing spiritual tool for self-discovery. So it's, we can use the records for discovering our life purpose, but we can also use the records for figuring out what we want to make for dinner or what color to wear for the day to bring more joy into our lives. We can use the records for pretty much any and all areas of our life, including the past, the present, and the future possibilities of what it is that we're wanting support on. Well, it's uh, something that we constantly talk about on this program uh, because it is paramount mm -hmm. to our mission here uh, to give people choices and knowledge of those choices to help make their dreams come true. And 
if you don't, it, it's kind of like, and I'll put it in this context, it's kind of like uh, just recently uh, I got a, a, a new a new used car. <laughs> um, it's newer than anything I've ever driven. It's only three years old instead of four or five years old. But it's got a lot of the new features. It's got a wonderful uh, a, a screen, touch screen in the center of the dash. Uh, it's It has uh, access to uh, all kinds of different things, different media, apps. Uh, I can uh, turn this off, turn that off. Uh, it's an all-wheel drive, but there's this knob down by the shifter that, you know, that uh, allows you to change terrain and so on and so forth. Cool. In other words, I am looking at um, some new things. There's there there's certain similarities to the... I'll call it analog <laughs> um, features in some of the cars that I've driven, but I have to sit there and I've got to go, okay, so how do I adjust the side view mirrors? All right. Okay. I figured that how do I lock and unlock the car and so on and so forth. And it's a push button. There's no key needed. Right. <laughs> uh, so you're getting used to all of the new things. <laughs> right. And the more I get used to all those new things on, oh, especially like, for example, I love using cruise control on the highway. Well, I have to think that my process of learning how to operate all the little different features is similar to how we need to approach learning about ourselves in order for us to, is, is maybe this is the right word, live an optimal life, to live a thriving life, to live a life on purpose, with uh, some people would even say to live a life with juice. <laughs> with that, juice, I love that. Yeah. yeah. So the records for me, it's all about for for life in general. How we use the records is about curiosity. Just like you were talking about your car, like what does this button do? What happens when I touch the screen? And so often people get nervous about exploring the why or the how or what could be done or what how you can be doing something. And if we take a step back and get curious about patterns, about thoughts, about behaviors that we are in, or we have been demonstrating, or we've always had, we get an opportunity to learn something new about ourselves and shift out of those old patterns and behaviors that are no longer serving us as well, which is really neat. But I like your car analogy because it is, it's like, we get excited about something new, but it can also be very nerve wracking getting something new too at the same time. But you have to be willing to be curious and make a mistake. Well, the 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 one thing that is is certainly of a frustration, and and uh, I think this still is along the lines of the same analogy. And the only reason why I'm now driving this new car, new used car. <laughs> is because the old one and it was a 2014 Ford F150 and I I really loved that truck. I mm -hmm. really did, but it it ended up getting totaled. I'm so and sorry. I, you know, and and I have to say that I have stopped saying this because it, it didn't help. And that is oh, I miss my truck. I miss my truck. But you know, it's you know, I'm moving on to something else. Maybe one day I'll get another one. And that's kind of, it seems to me like that. that is the analogous to, I don't really want to look at myself and go delve deep because it's, I'm comfortable where I'm at. Yeah. So there's, using that analogy, because I love that you said, I miss my truck because mm -hmm. we can mourn something that we've lost, even if it's a material thing, right? Because we're comfortable with how that made us feel and we like the features of it and everything like that. And so when we are mourning something or we're having a hard time with something, and we can use this as an example, the car, we can go, we can go into the records, we can ask the guardians, can you tell me more on why I'm mourning this? How can I overcome this chapter in my life, even if it's a car, 
or even if it's something in a relationship, you could be in a relationship with someone, be it romantic or non-romantic, and maybe you're mourning the loss or needing help with shifting out of a relationship that you're in, and they're willing to support you. The beautiful thing is the guardians are always going to share language that you understand. So If you are the type of person that loves certain slang words, they're going to talk to you in those slang words, where if you're, let's say, a doctor or an intellect, they're going to talk to you in those, the lingo and the terms that you know and understand so that it's relatable Mm -hmm. because they want to be relatable. Also, the guardians are also very approachable too. I think that sometimes people think that, They have to show up like in this mystic or angelic way where everything has to be perfect. They have to set a a certain amount of time down. They have to be, it has to be really quiet. It needs to be the perfect situation, the perfect setting, and they don't care. They just want you to show up and ask questions because they want to support you. They don't care what you're wearing. They don't care if your house is a mess. They don't care if it's chaotic. They don't care if you're um, having a bad day. What they care about is taking care of you and supporting you. And the best time to show up and ask for support is when you are having a bad day, when you're having a character building moment, when you're confused or when you're excited or when you're nervous, whatever ray of emotions that you're experiencing, they want to be a part of that at any moment in time when you're wanting guidance. These are referred to, you refer to them as guardians, correct? So I refer to them as the guardians of the records or the masters, teachers, and loved ones. Okay. So I know that uh, the the Akashic records that we're going to talk about here on the program are not in some physical library building, et cetera, et cetera. They're, they're ethereal, if you will. Mm-hmm. Uh, I want to talk a little bit as we continue here about uh, the first of all, uh, how how you began this process. And we're going to do that. Amy, Amy Robeson is my guest. And we're talking about uh, Akashic Records and how you can um, investigate your own. Okay. Matter of fact, I don't think you can investigate anybody else's but your own, uh, I suppose, unless you have permission. Uh, and yes. we're going to talk more about that as we continue here on Tell Me Your Story. I'm Richard Dugan, your host, and uh, Amy Robeson is my guest. We are talking about the work that she is doing uh, through her website, in particular, theamyrobeson.robeson.com. As I said before, we'll be linked to your website. When did you first find out about the existence of the Akashic Records? Well, my first spiritual teacher, her name was Elizabeth Barron. She's transitioned. She was a trans, uh, a dental median. Um, and she had channeling abilities like Edgar Casey. Edgar Casey was an Akashic record uh, practitioner. He would channel the records. He was considered the sleeping prophet. And I went to my teacher, Elizabeth, to learn how to do dream interpretation. And by working with her, I ended up accessing the records through different meditation processes and very unknowingly, very unconsciously, I I started accessing the records. And once I started accessing different levels of consciousness, the records really started to come forward into my reality where I became very, 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 very interested in them. And I needed to know everything about them. And if for anybody that's listening and they don't know what the records are, the Akashic Records is a field of infinite possibilities. We can go into this field and open our records and speak to the guardians of the records, also known as the masters, teachers, and loved ones for any and all areas of our life. Everything from the moment your soul is incepted is recorded inside of the Akashic Records. So everything and anything has an Akashic Records, and we can go in and ask for support, and they'll support us in anything you can think of, they'll support you in it. You said when your soul is incepted? Yes. Define that for me. So uh, the moment your soul becomes into existence, you it starts to record what your soul is doing. So not coming, not not coming into physical form, but literally nope. 
coming into existence as a spiritual being. Yes, it coming into consciousness. Uh, does that mean that at, at some point we, and, and maybe uh, um, because I've always been taught and believed that we are all part of, shall we say, the one. Mm -hmm. So does that mean that at some point we were part of the one, but we were not an individual soul? And at some point there was some decision made to to for my soul to so to speak split off from the one even though i'm still connected mm -hmm. i'm still part of but now i am um a combination uh connected and individual soul yes so we are creator is us we are creator creator dwells within us right and so we are connected to that and so the records itself like creation as in records, but we have our own records as well. And our soul has had many different experiences, not just in human form, that we can go in and we can tap into um, inside of the Akashic records. And so in terms of like, it's one of those um, spiritual questions where it's like, what came first, the chicken or the egg mm -hmm. <laughs> kind of questions where you mm -hmm. start thinking about this, but in terms of your own records and what you have access to, when you learn how to access your own records, you're able to access anything your soul has ever experienced. And because we are not, um, we're multidimensional and as a human, we're living on linear time, but our multidimensional self is li living on cosmic time so everything is happening simultaneously and so we can get guidance on any of those areas or timelines that we are on as well okay and of course uh um on the one hand i'm not sure if you're familiar with a book called the impersonal life uh by a gentleman jim banner it was written back in the 30s and actually there were a number of books that he wrote um uh there was i think one called the way and then the kingdom and so forth. Uh, in any event, uh, the impersonal life is like a conversation. It's more one-sided. Uh, uh, and, and it's, it was channeled by him. I don't know if he was similar to say an Edgar Casey or, or what have you. Uh, and I, I have read Edgar Casey's works. It's been a long time, but I've always found that fascinating. There was another gentleman by the name of Johannes Graeber. He mm -hmm. wrote a book entitled the, the communication with the spirit world of God. And he was a Catholic priest, but he was channeling this entity. Mm -hmm. And of course, the book, which is really thick, even though it's very thin paper, it's a very thick book. I, re I actually read that one also. Uh, my mother at the time didn't care for it because we were both, we were raised, born and raised Catholic. And it didn't have a lot of kind words to say about Catholicism. <laughs> but uh, I, my, I personally love the rituals, the traditions and the ceremony. But anyway, um, uh, this conversation in the impersonal life has to do with God talking to you and telling you at one point uh, in the chapter on reincarnation, you think that you have lived other lives in your past, uh, that it, those are separate. And when you go into uh, uh, past life regression, uh, you are tapped into past lives. But I tell you, you have not lived, but you are tapped. Oh, I can't hear you. You are tapping into lives of my manifestation. And I find that interesting. I find it interesting that that's a perspective. And then I got to thinking about that. Okay, well, what is the whole point of, of, of a past life regression? Well, it's to learn a little bit about self. It's the, it's the same process as to going into the Akashic Records. So whether it's tapping into the manifestations of God in, in previous centuries or millennia, or tapping into lives you've lived in the past, the whole purpose is, again, to learn about self, which is what the Akashic Records are all about. Yeah, absolutely. And the thing about, so we call them past life regressions. So I think that our human mind can wrap around that it happened in the past. But mm -hmm. again, because we're multidimensional beings, we fractile when something happens. And we can get stuck frozen in time. So a part of our consciousness gets stuck frozen in time on that 
particular space and time. And so part of past life regressions is to one, discover what gifts or abilities or magnificent miracles that you experienced in that previous lifetime, but also you could do a past life regression to understand what's keeping you stuck and where you're frozen in time, what trauma you experienced, so that not only can you retrieve that aspect of your soul that's being stuck in that situation, but to also reclaim your wholeness Mm -hmm. and to recognize your wholeness and to recognize your sovereignty. And so the, I always tell my students, don't glamorize past lives because you'll often hear people go, I was a queen in a previous lifetime. Yes, but what did you learn from that lifetime? Mm. Besides this awesome thing that you were. And yes, you were that thing, but what did, what is it teaching you right now in this particular moment? What did you learn from experiencing that? And that's really, anytime we're exploring anything from the past, it's to understand its impact in your present moment and its impact on your future trajectory as well. Yeah. I find it fascinating. How many people say I was uh, the queen of Sheba. I was um, Genghis Khan. I mean, in other words, there are multiple people who will claim to be the same person. It's like, all right. uh, I think that if that were the case, the reason why this person was the way they were was because they were schizophrenic. Uh, because too many of you were occupying his body or her body, something like that. I don't know. You know, it's, you know, there, there are drop-ins. So you could have someone that dropped into that soul multiple times or, yeah. so, I mean, it is feasible if we think sure. about it that way, but to me, it's sometimes um, misinterpreted information that mm-hmm. some people yeah. get in terms of past lives. And I think that it's really important when we're working with the tool to practice it because it's not about glamorizing it. It's about practicing the tool so that you have a better understanding of yourself. Amy Robeson's my guest and you are listening to what else? Tell me your story. I'm Richard Dugan, your host. And uh, we're talking about the Akashic records. I want to dive into an area where uh, uh, you, you've shared with us a little bit about how you first found out. I want to know a little bit more about how you we're able to ascertain the process of accessing your Akashic records. So for for me, I was accessing the records and I was being shown a specific way to teach my soul tribe on how to do it. I'm very connected with the crystal and energy. I've been around crystals since I was a kid. My mom's collected crystals since she was a kid. My grandma collects crystals. Um, And so I was shown to teach and to access the records using crystalline energy. And so I teach my students a very simple method of accessing the records. It's not a long drawn out method. We need to, some practices have to be modernized where we can't take 30 minutes just to open up something to start getting answers. And so the way that I teach my students on how to access the records is we have a very simple process. It, you can access them in less than two minutes. And we use the crystalline energy to access them. The crystalline energy not only creates um, connection, but it also creates a mini healing and um, supports and accessing the records and supports the students and accessing the records. And each person is given a unique set of crystals to open up their records. It's like their own, their own unique keys. Ah, okay. In other words, it's not push button like the, uh, the, the Volkswagen I drive now. <laughs> you need a key <laughs> and it's unique to you. Yes. Um, can you get access to anybody else's Akashic records, even with permission? If I were to say, Hey, uh, could you, uh, cause I don't know the process right now. Could you access my Akashic records and tell me what's there? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, I teach my students and, and myself, like, um, for our level one, we teach how to open the records for yourself because you need to learn how to do that first. 
but then also how to open the records for other people. And it is right, Richard, you have to have permission from the other person. I can't just go into someone else's records without asking permission, without them giving me permission to go into their records because we would be very conspiritual laws. Now, I would think, too, that you cannot open anyone's Akashic records who has already passed on to the other side. No, because how are you going to get how are you going to get permission? No, and it, it there's a ways that we can go and ask certain things, but like if my mother passed away or your grandmother passed away or something like that, and I have students that will ask me like, "Can I open their records?" Absolutely not. You cannot open their records. But I have um, power of attorney. What's the deal? <laughs> <laughs> now, if their spirit came and said. You mm. can access my records. Sure. Mm. Um, but I would take caution in how and what and the way that you would do it, because it's more of an advanced um, practice if you're doing that. But typically, no. And I'm not for me, I'm not typically interested in um, accessing uh, deceased records. If I'm interested in a topic or a subject I can ask around my responsibility to that topic or subject or that person, but not, I don't need to access their records in order to understand it. Like I can understand it in terms of my responsibility. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting, it's interesting to be able to do that. It's, it's, it's um, not quite uh, the 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 concept of uh, uh, one journaling and writing about things that are happening in their lives as they go through what they're feeling, what they're experiencing and so forth, which I did. Interestingly enough, I never thought I would ever do it, but I started because uh, I was given one of those blank books and I started at the age of 21. Now, I didn't keep going with it, unfortunately, I and I but I have several of these handwritten books. And I go back through that. I'm going, really? And I have to give myself, I have to cut myself some slack saying, well, no, wait a minute. That's where you were at the time. Yes. That's where you were. And so are these Akashic records, for example, when one passes over uh, and they start to go through that review process, is that's what's being, is that is what is, I'm having trouble with my uh, uh, tenant ten, tenses here. Is that what is being accessed for that review, their Akashic records, or is that something separate? Well, the review is within the Akash. And so everything is within the Akashic field. Um, so everything's recorded in there. And so we can go into there and we can look at it and we can access it. Um I'm not, because I haven't been through the review process in my human life, I can't for sure say, hey, this is exactly, they're going right inside of the Akashic Records to open it. Because oftentimes people will find themselves in the Akashic Records unknowingly. And the review process, when we transition, we review our life, that entire life is recorded in the Akash, but I'm not sure what field they're taken to. Okay. Because I know that they different from my understanding and my belief is that depending on where you're at consciously, you move into a different level of consciousness. And when you graduate from that level of consciousness, you move into another level of consciousness. And so you do your review before you move to your next level of consciousness that you're meant to move into. Are you familiar with the movie with Meryl Streep and Albert Brooks on uh, defending your life? Uh, no. she is having the time of her life. She is, uh, they're, they're actually living almost similar to if they were here on earth, but they're there at a table filled with food and she's just scarfing it down, knowing that she can eat as much as she wants and she won't gain a pound. Albert, on the other hand, is scared out of his mind. Every time he goes into the, the room for review, he feels as though. Uh, he's being judged. And, ah, and he, I, don't, I think I have seen that movie. Oh, it's it's a wonderful, wonderful film. Uh, and and uh, I can't remember how it ends, and I'm not even going to try. But uh, they're driven around on these golf carts and so forth, and it is just hilarious. Uh, his his response to the afterlife, and specifically the review. And no matter what else he's doing, no matter what else is available to him to experience uh, and so forth, 
uh, he's just in fear almost the whole time in angst. But she, no, she is, she is joyful. She is blissful, having the grandest time. Talk um, about two different souls having two different conscious experiences. And yet they're sort of experiencing it together. In other words, they, mm -hmm. they seem to be paired up. Now, I've, uh, are you familiar with Life Between Life's therapy? No, I'm not. Doc, yeah, Dr. Uh, oh, boy. Now I can't remember the gentleman's name off the top of my head. I've got several of his books in my um, Audible uh, library. Basically, it's a hypnosis that... Um, Brian Weiss? No, 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 no. Uh, while I'm telling you this, I will I will see if I can't bring it up. Uh, but uh, he, um, uh, he basically... These books are basically um, uh, studies uh, that he does. He is uh, uh, taking people through... Uh, the the process it's a it's a, a conscious hypnosis and I've been through it. There's a practitioner practitioner oh. if I can say it here in Santa Barbara, for example, who um, has uh, uh, taken me through. And I have to tell you that there are times I would like to go back <laughs> to the life um, that I had before this one. It was because it was so extraordinary. Uh, I I just I was a pioneer, you know, I was had a farm and a, a few cattle and so forth, nothing huge. And I lost my farm. It burned down. And I also had a cabin in the mountains and um, came out one afternoon, sat down on a chair, kicked my feet up on the rail and basically tipped my hat back and said, man, it's been a good life. And I just left. I just left. And. Uh -huh. It was uh, 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 it was extraordinary uh, because there are times when, like I said, I, I just want to go back to that experience. Um, Dr. Michael Newton, uh, Destiny mm -hmm. of Souls, Journey of Souls are two of the books, and they are uh, listings of case studies. I love and, I love books like that. Oh, yeah. And um the thing is, is that it, it takes you through the process following the passing, the departing from the body, uh, where you might hang around on, on the earth plane for a short time just to kind of check on people, make sure everything's all right. Or maybe to console people, say, hey, everything's all right. I think my sister did that. And then you might go into a, this is a relative term, a period of rest. Mm-hmm. And then you go into your review just to kind of see what happened and what you learned. And there are actually classes you can take there. You're still yes. learning. Yes. Which is fascinating. Yeah. You have a whole team that's supporting you. Yeah. And then you are encouraged to go back because you now have something that the world needs. Mm -hmm. And you're connected to this, the cluster of people. Of souls, mm -hmm. I should say. Yeah, I mean, you have your soul family. Yeah, and it can be huge. It can be enormous, certainly. Yeah. Uh, and anybody that comes into your realm of existence in on the earth plane is a member of your cluster. Mm -hmm. And um, it's just fascinating. Uh, I loved it. I, I just thought it was it was really cool. I find all that stuff really neat. What a, another good book is um, Many Lives, Many Masters. Yes, I've read that. Uh-huh. That's a good one. It's a short read. And then the book that I love the most that talks about uh, transitioning is the autobiography of a yogi. My metaphysical primer. It, I love that book. Um, the way that he, the second I, cause I listened to audiobooks just like you second, I heard him explain death. I was, I didn't really have a fear of death, but any fear that I had was completely dispelled because I'm like, if I pass tomorrow, I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> like, I am good. I, I have work still to do, but I am good. Like I'll be okay. And, um, I just love when we get insights like that from teachers that break it down in such a way that it's visceral. I can feel it in my soul as true. Yeah. And I've had family members that have passed and recently had a family member that passed and I could see her doing her review and, and, and looking over her mistakes and 
um, contemplating what she wanted to do next and her coming forward to talk to me. Like it's such a beautiful experience to have that and to understand it too. Cause it allows you to let go of any fear around death. Cause that's the biggest fear for most mm-hmm. people. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it, it, for me, it's interesting because of the experiences I've had just with, uh, for the first time in my life, 63 years uh, of existence here, which is nothing like, it's it's less than a puff of smoke, uh, experiencing uh, the departure of my eldest sister, and then, of course, of my father. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting how I think more and more about him, more so than her, uh, of late, things come to mind, uh, certain triggers will come up, and I just, I'm just, I'm, 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 I, I don't know. I guess the word is I'm in awe of what he and my mother uh, came together to create, what they chose to create, what they wanted in their lives, and they got it. And they they made it happen. That's amazing. Yeah. And uh, my mother, who is still with us, um, uh, they almost made it to 66 years of marriage. My father lived almost to 92. Um, he had a good long life. Yeah. And uh, and she she will actually be uh, eighty nine this September. When you work with people, which I'm 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 guessing that you do 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 that kind of work both in person now as well as online, you know the the various uh, platforms. What kind of information do you need from that person in order to access their records? Just their name. Okay. Yeah, just their name and that just giving us permission to open them. And um, it's it's very simple. And um, what comes forward depends on the person and what, what they're wanting to work on in the moment. And it might be something that they're wanting to work on life purpose. A lot of life purpose stuff comes up, but it could be, you know, like, how do I, how do I communicate with my spouse or um, I'm, I'm grieving. How do I process this grief or I need to make some money? Like, what can I do to make some money right now? What comes forward always serves the highest good. And the guardians only share what what the person is ready to receive, even if it doesn't fully land for them at that moment in time, Mm -hmm. because oftentimes we have to have other experiences to fully understand what it is that we received from the guardians of the records. And it can take a day. Sometimes it can take years. Like I've had messages that they've shared with me where I didn't really fully understand it until just recently and i've been playing in the record records for over a decade and i'm just like oh that's what they meant but i've had to have a bunch of other experiences and the beautiful thing about the records is they're offering you a 360 degree perspective they're Mm -hmm. they're offering you perspectives that you wouldn't have considered because oftentimes as a human we get tunnel vision we only think that we can only do something a particular way and that's the way it's always been done we've been conditioned to believe that but if we take those sets of conditions and we turn them upside down we spit them on their head we just squash them it completely changes what we're able to do and sometimes just hearing that we have permission to do something differently makes the world of a difference I think that's one of the things, too. I had a, a fascinating conversation with uh, a gentleman. Uh, his name is actually Lion, Lion Goodman. Oh, and, I like it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and he and I were talking about this whole aspect of perspective. And that when you take a look at the what is perceived as polarization, specifically in this country, he says it isn't so much polarization as much as it is individuals getting trapped in their ego and asserting that their perspective is correct, is right, is the only perspective. How could you see it any other way? Right. And when you start taking a look at people and listening to them, please listen, 
you begin to realize that for whatever reason, they have that perspective. Exactly. And it's valid for them. And uh, my Mm -hmm. best example is of um, when I was a kid growing up in Phoenix, Uh, And I mean, I'm talking about eight or nine years old, maybe even younger. I used to think of myself as that little tiny character that was inside the big alien in Men in Black laying out on that surgical table. And they Ah! cut the big head open. And there's this little guy in there running the show on the inside, right? Yeah. I used to think of myself as that little guy on the inside of the big body And that the rest of the world was there for me. But then I also had to acknowledge that that was the case for everybody Mm -hmm. else that I saw. Yes, absolutely. So it doesn't invalidate someone else's perspective. You can still disagree with them. Keep it to yourself. It doesn't matter whether you disagree with them. It's uh, kind of what I went through uh, when I was working for a Christian station. And people would talk about their experiences. And then, of course, there would be those who would criticize saying, no, nah, it doesn't say that in the Bible that one can have out of body experiences over and over again. There's, It's appointed the man once to die and then the judgment. And it's like, but what you're basically saying is this person had this supernatural experience and you're telling them it's wrong and you are undermining their personal faith, their personal beliefs their personal whatever you want to call it they had right. that experience and it changed them leave them alone i right. i i don't judge anybody in that regard i i'm fascinated by those that's where empathy and compassion comes in i think that the more that we can have multiple perspectives on any given situation we can have empathy and compassion for not only ourselves, but for others, Mm -hmm. because you've never walked a day in their shoes. You have no idea what they've experienced and why they're coming up with that belief system to begin with. And it all comes down to a set of conditionings. Like I remember when my husband, I lived, um, I grew up in Wisconsin and I moved down to South Carolina. And I remember driving down to, to, to move there with, with my now husband. And we we're talking about houses. I was like, oh yeah, we can't buy a house on the corner. There'd be too much to shovel and snow. And I'm like, <laughs> but it's conditioning. There is no snow in South Carolina where we're moving. So, but it's like, you have to relearn these sets of conditions and eliminate them when it doesn't actually fit the scenario of your life or the situation of your life that you're in anymore, but everybody has the ability to hold compassion at the forefront when you don't disagree with someone, if you're willing to do it. Yeah, And it's okay if you disagree, because if we agreed on everything, we it would be a very boring world. My sentiments. Exactly. Amy Robeson's my guest. The Amy Robeson.com is the website. And this is Tell Me Your Story. I'm Richard Dugan, your host. And uh, I want to ask you, Amy Robeson, uh, about um, uh, this uh, this aspect of the Akashic Records. It's been recording. uh, I can only imagine the size of the hard drives holding all of that data. Amazing. Anyway, (laughs) I mean, I think about all of the YouTube videos and all of the videos, all of the, 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 the recorded information that we've been gathering for the last couple of decades and the size of of the servers you know and 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 so on and so forth the cloud it's one of the reasons why i don't buy movies uh like on dvd or something like that or downloads nor do i buy music anymore um i i listen to what i listen to on spotify because that's where it's at you know if i want to go back and watch um uh, def- uh, defending your life, I think is the title of it. Uh, then I'll do a Google search to find out which platform has it and watch it. Exactly. Or I loved the old Bob Newhart series. Absolutely fabulous stuff. And I know there, I think it's on Hulu. So I go to Hulu and I watch it. I don't need the physical platform. Uh, it's it's all in the cloud as it were. Uh, and that's where the uh, Akashic records are. Um, you left 
a rather uh, secure, so to speak, uh, corporate job at mm-hmm. one point uh, in 2015 mm-hmm. and, and said, bye bye. What yeah. in the world is going on there? What happened? Everything in life comes down to fulfillment. And for me, even though I was successful, I wasn't fulfilled. I knew that I had a deeper purpose, a deeper mission. I didn't know what it was um, before I even knew what I was about to do. I just knew that I was meant to be doing something, something different, something more. And, um, And everybody thought I was crazy. Like, they're like, why would you, why, why are you giving this up? Like, why would you do that? And it's, because I knew in my heart it was the right thing to do. Now I have the, the, I get the opportunity to have a conversation with you and speak with people all around the world and learn about their lives and help them and support them and shifting out of their struggles and into something that they're really wanting to do or loving to do and loving their life in a different way. And it's such an amazing thing to, to witness and I get to be a part of it. And I'm so happy I followed the energy because I think like life in general, if you follow the energy where your heart is showing you to go, it will never stir you wrong. Mm. Even if there's um, a struggle on that path, that struggle is meant to support you in your ultimate experience in this lifetime. And so the more that we follow our heart's path and our heart's beacon, the more that we're shown what we're meant to be doing in that particular moment in time. And we have many, 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 many purposes in our lifetime. And we get to fulfill those all throughout our lifetime if we're willing to do it. And for me, this is part of my purpose and part of my mission. And do you find that people who come to you are willing to do it or is there are, is there a certain percentage of the people who are still reticent? We have, um, my students are wanting change. And when they sign up for something, they're so excited. That does not mean fears do not come up because fears come up when we're doing this really deep work. And anybody that's willing to put the work in, they absolutely see the shifts and they see the shifts in a very short period of time. Because most of the programs that I teach, specifically Sacred Awakening, which is my Kashuk Record program, it's a four month long program. And people's lives change within that four months of just them getting curious about who they are and what they can do differently in their life. Hmm. What other courses do you offer? Oh, I offer all sorts of weird things from <laughs> <laughs> I like calling them weird because they're weird. So um, we do uh, a course that's called light language magic. So light language is an ancient form of communication. It is similar to speaking in tongue. And so um, you'll channel different levels of higher consciousness when you speak light language or you use the different forms of light language, which is like spoken, uh, written movement. Um, It moves past the conscious mind to the subconscious mind, and it knocks out anything that is blocking you. And what it does is it works and communicates with your higher self. So your higher self can support you in your soul's evolution as well. So I do that. I do DNA activations. We do crystal programs, spirit guide programs, animal spirit guide programs, all sorts of fun, weird stuff. Mm. So it sounds like uh, you've got a few different modalities there to support the work that you're doing to help people to, uh, Know thyself. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Are there are there uh, um, practical uh, applications, if you will, uh, in terms of uh, let's say I'm uh, let's say I'm uh, running a business, uh, and uh, uh, I'd really like for it to uh, certainly. Uh, be more successful uh, and so forth without, because there comes a point when if it's just you, especially uh, you end up taking on a little more than you can really handle. You know, there's a bit off a little bit more than you can chew. Uh, and, and at the same time, like me, I, I'm not interested in competing with anybody because I recognize the reality that 
there's always going to be someone better than me. And then there's going to be somebody at the bottom uh, below me uh, on those rungs on the ladder. And there's plenty of opportunity for us all. Oh, this yes. is something I think that the corporate world has forgotten has, has, or has never learned is that there's more than enough for everybody. You don't need oh, for to. for sure. You know. I agree. But what about uh, that aspect of, of utilizing the Akashic records in that context? Is it still, does it still come down to a personal uh, issue? So in that regard? For, for me, I have built my entire business using the Akashic records. Mm-hmm. Um, I have built every program, every offer. I do every meditation, every activation, every healing inside of the Akashic records. My through line for my entire business is the Akashic records. Um, it, you don't, and you don't have to be a healer to use the Akashic records for, for your business. You can go into the records and ask like, how can I build my business? How, how, um, what's preventing me from, um, moving my business into the next level or what subconscious belief do I have around my business that's that's blocking my success or what is something that I'm not looking at in my business that I, it would be great would serve my highest good to consider implementing mm -hmm. there's all sorts of different questions that you can ask depending on what area and topic of your business you want to look at because as an entrepreneur, we wear many, 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 many hats. Mm -hmm. And so you can ask all sorts of different questions. And then your business itself has an Akashic Records as well. And so we can not only open your records, but we can open your business Akashic Records too. Okay. So if the Akashic Records begin recording, once you have been brought into individual spirit, how uh, how is that uh how does that work with a business so let um the best way to explain this is i'm going to use another example that's not a business let's say you found an old antique and you own it you can open up the records because you own that antique if you got permission from the spirit of the antique to open the records, you can open up the records and discover all sorts of information about it. Just like you can open up a, the records of a crystal, as long as you have permission from the crystal to do it. If you are your business owner, your business is an entity. It has its own consciousness. It has its own energy. Um, you can go in and you can open up the records of the business and the energy of your records versus your business records is very different. And um, oftentimes my students will be like, wow, that was a different experience from then going in my records. It just feels different or it sounds different. The energy is different because it's own, it's its own entity. It's its own energy. It's its own its consciousness. Wow. I never even thought about that in spite of the fact that uh, I have a, a good friend, a Vedic astrologer, who when uh, we are talking about countries, for example, whether it be the United States or otherwise, uh, in terms of, uh, okay, so uh, what date? Because he needs a birthplace, birth date, birth time, uh, and and so forth in order to uh, create, generate a, a Vedic astrology uh, chart. And we accept as july 4th 1776 as the birth of the united states of mm -hmm. america um you know some might actually some might even use maybe the beginning of the revolutionary war as, as that or whatever when the finally when the uh, con uh, the constitution was finally ratified and adopted and all and so mm -hmm. on and so forth uh everybody's got different points of view in that regard very very interesting how even a business can have its own Akashic yeah. records. Folks, Just like um, the United States has a record, China has a record, yeah. the earth has a record. It's like, it's just, it's really neat on how deep you can go with it and how different students have different specialties on what they're drawn to in the records as well. And I would take it that these records, these are, uh, these are uh, in a manner of speaking written in stone in that they can't be changed. They are what they are. 
because they're a recording, if you will, a record of what happened. It is a recording of, yes. And so um, we can go in. There are some people that believe that you can delete things from the records. I am not one of those people that believe that something can be deleted. I believe that you can transform something. Mm -hmm. Um, meaning like if we were going in and you had a past life and you had a traumatic experience and it's has caused, let's say some sort of, um, dis-ease within this lifetime, we can go in, transform that past life, retrieve that aspect of your soul, but we're not deleting that past life. We're healing the trauma of that past life so that it can transfer over into this lifetime. I would also take it, it might might even help people uh, to discontinue having regrets over certain things uh, because regret, basically you're saying, if I could only go back and make a different decision, however, if you did, you would no longer be the person you are in this present moment. Exactly. Yeah. So we can use the records to look at buried emotions. So it could be regret, it could be shame, it could be guilt, it could be sadness or fear, whatever it is that's buried or is still very alive, maybe it is to your awareness, like that you have this regret. Um, We can go in and look at it and we can not only look at it, we can actually see if that's where it stemmed from or if it stemmed from somewhere else. And then we can go back and heal that part too. Mm, Interesting. Uh, All of this is just so fascinating. Um, so the the you can teach people to go into their own Akashic records on their own. You yes. can also go into their records and uh, uh, provide information based upon what questions that they would uh, they would uh, uh, put forth. Yeah, yeah. So I teach simple. people how to open the records for themselves and for others. And then how we do, like, let's say a consultation for someone that's that person would come forward and they would prepare a question or maybe they don't really know what they want to focus on and they want it just to be more general. They can have a more general session as well. Mm. And, And you've been doing this for, you said over 10 years? Yes. Wow. Now, when you, uh, I, I'm also curious about your upbringing in terms of the philosophy that you were raised with and how um, that has changed, because I'm pretty certain it has. My mom, we, we weren't church people. I actually um, was very fascinated with God. I was very fascinated, like whenever the Jehovah Witnesses would come knock on our door, I would like sit there and ask them a bunch of questions because I wanted to go to church. I was very interested in God. And my mom would always say, you don't have to go to church to believe in God. You can just believe in God. And um, I had my own like little altar growing up where I would collect angels and I would pray. Nobody taught me this. I just did it on my own just because I, I felt the need to do it. And my family was very spiritual. My grandma um, did astrology readings, tarot card readings. And so um, collected crystals, like my family's very open to an, it, to this type of work um, where I feel very fortunate where some, some people, some people's families grew up very religious and it's taboo. And so for me, um, I, I grew up where it's just like, you could believe in God. It's great. And then in my twenties, I started going to church on my own. And then, um, I just started, um, how I really found my spirituality is I, um, found yoga. I was getting some intuitive hits. I didn't have that term at the time, but I just felt that I needed to go to yoga and I was extremely depressed and so I started going to yoga and then um, I started going to church. And then when I moved to Charleston, South Carolina, I didn't find a church that I liked. Um, I didn't feel welcomed. It didn't feel right. And so um, I just made my own church. I made my own church at home and I started meditating and I just started following the energy of whatever presented itself to me that I was interested in doing from meditation to crystals, to the Akashic records, to hand on healing, anything you name it. Like I was trying to to investigate it because I was super curious about it. Um, and my family has just been very 
open about anything that I do. They're, they don't, they're, they're okay with it, which I feel very fortunate because I know not everybody's family is like that. Mm. Yeah. I, I, I was born and raised, as I said, uh, Catholic. We live next door to a large family of Mormons. Never had a problem. We all played together. And it was only years later that I read about the, uh, the rift between the Catholics and the Mormons and how the Mormons viewed the Catholic church. Uh, but we didn't care. Uh, I no, went of course to- not. You're innocent children. You yeah. just want to play and have fun. Although I will tell you, I did go one Sunday to Mormon services, came home. Mom says, where were you? And I said, oh, I went with the James over to the, you know, to have uh, to go to church. They said, well, it doesn't count. You still have to go to mass. Uh, so I did. I did. It's like I thought it would count, but it did not. Anyway, <laughs> um, and I just I try. Just, that, yeah, exactly. And I, I just uh, slowly but surely just began investigating a whole kinds of all kinds of other things. As I said, autobiography of a yogi and the self-realization fellowship. I found two other branches of that philosophy in the self-inquiry life fellowship. We have a monastery here in Santa Barbara. Actually, I think it's in uh, up in the hills in uh, Montecito uh, cool. that I've been to. I've even interviewed the uh, the head of 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 that particular group here. And then there's a, a third a group um, uh, headed by uh, a gentleman who has since passed, Sri uh, Kriyananda. He was mm-hmm. at the time of his, before his passing, he was the last living teaching disciple of Paramahansa Yogananda. Mm. Uh, and he started uh, an, uh, a, a, a village, if you will, a community up north of uh, Nevada City here in California called Ananda Village, which we visited. And I've actually interviewed uh, the folks who who run that facility. Uh, I've had them on this program as well. And it was it's really been interesting how I have been drawn back to that philosophy over and over again. Um, me too. Ha- but here's here's a really perplexing question for you. I have never found, and quite honestly, because I really haven't been looking, for an individual to, no. you know, so to speak, I don't know that I'd want to follow, you know, uh, because I recognize uh, not only the humanity, but the human frailties and tendencies, and that that's not where the philosophy lies. I, I'm i the same way, Richard. I, I, I've never been drawn to claim someone as my guru. I think that some people are drawn to do that and that's their path and it's it's great for them. Uh, for me, I take a little from everything that I'm learning and I leave behind whatever doesn't feel right because we're all human. We're having a human experience. Part of the human experience is making mistakes and growing from those mistakes And I think that when we put someone up on a pedestal, we get ourselves in trouble Mm -hmm. because what we're saying is they're better than us and we're not equal to them. And when it comes to teachings, we're all equal in some way, shape or form. I might understand this a little differently at this moment in time, but you understand something else that I might not understand differently. And together we create this beautiful synergy of understanding. And I believe that when we give ourselves permission to see ourselves empowered on our path and that we have the choice and the decisions that we get to make each and every day to allow ourselves to evolve, allow our consciousness to expand, We are empowering ourselves to continue on our path because you are the only person each and every day that you wake up that gets to decide what you're going to do. If you don't want to do it, your teacher can't make you do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, They just can't. You are the only one that gets to make that decision. They can inspire you to do something, Mm -hmm. but eventually you will take another path and something else is going to interest you. And you got to be accountable for your own actions. Your teacher, your guru is not, is not responsible for that. You are. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, I tell you what, 
being born and raised Catholic and, of course, working uh, for 15. I worked for 15 years at the Christian radio station. Responsibility was the last thing that they wanted to take for their lives. Mm -hmm. If it was bad, it was the devil. If it was good, it was God. And it's like, what are you, a puppet on a string being manipulated by forces you don't understand? Get a grip here. You were given this life and free will. Um, it's it's just fascinating. Amy Robeson is my guest, and uh, theamyrobeson.com is the website, and this is Tell Me Your Story. I'm Richard Dugan, your host here on the program that uh, we like to uh, refer to as New Paradigms for a New World, giving you choices and knowledge of those choices to help make your dreams come true. Talking with Amy Robeson and Amy Robeson, theamyrobeson.com. That's right. It's it's her, the Amy Robeson. And uh, we are most appreciative of the time that you have given us here on the program today. We're very happy to have had the opportunity to talk with you about these aspects of the Akashic Records and the different courses that you have available through your website. People can certainly contact you and find out more uh, about what you have to offer and how it will benefit them and the people around them. Now, the beautiful thing that I love about not only the work that you do, but many of our guests uh, epitomizes a, 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 an old saying that you can't change other people. Well, that's not entirely true. You can. You can't do it intentionally. But when you change you, you change the people around you. They're, either, they're going to be those who are going to want to get closer to you or there are going to be those who are going to want to get just as far away from you as they can. Uh, and that's fine. That's perfectly okay. Uh, it's their, per it's their right to be around the people that they want to be around. And, and I recognize too, that with some of the stuff that's going on in this country in particular, there are those the people that I, I don't want to watch. I will be watching, you know, those shorts, short videos on YouTube. And, and as soon as I start hearing the words coming out of their mouth, I swipe up, swipe to the next one. I like the comedies, uh, not so much of a fan of the fails. It's like, you know, their people are getting hurt. Really? This is fun? I, I don't care too much for that, but that's me. That's good. You're censoring your feed. Yeah. I think it's so important that we are very conscious of what we're consuming. Yeah. By the way, folks, speaking of which, I'm back on Facebook. I decided that I'm going to start to post every interview that I do. Uh, the podcast specifically, I will then post to my Facebook account. That's the primary purpose of it. If you expect me to like anything that you send, forget about it. I, I'm not in the business of liking stuff, okay? Uh, if you're interested in what we are presenting through Facebook uh, from Tell Me Your Story, uh, that's wonderful. And if you're not, that's wonderful too. But I, I, I'm not into that. I'm not into that game, uh, uh, you know, and that kind of stuff. Will I friend certain people? People I know. Okay. Not people. For example, I now know you, Amy. And if I find you on Facebook, I will face, I will, um, I will friend you. Okay. Awesome. But I'm not going to just friend anybody. I've got relatives and family members that I have Facebooked, uh, uh, good heavens, that I have uh, <laughs> friended uh, and so forth. And I will probably work on adding to my story, I guess, that little feature. Mm -hmm. um, but I think this is one of the problems. It's like I had one woman who uh, I who wanted to be on the, uh, the, no, who actually I did have as a guest on the program many years ago. And the next thing I know, she's contacting me about getting uh, abuse on online from this actor in Hollywood and so on and so forth. The only advice that I could give her was get off of Facebook then. Just mm -hmm. shut it down and start another account. You can do that. Uh, and and the, yet these people who get bullied, uh, they wonder why it goes on for so long. Well, it's because you choose to stay. I'm not saying there's, that that's right to be bullied on, on online disconnect you know uh it, it just it i don't know uh, that's just me <laughs> i have three final questions i want to ask you i ask all of my guests these three final questions but before i ask you those questions i want to thank you for 
Listening to and watching Tell Me Your Story, New Paradigms for a New World, where we are giving you choices and knowledge of those choices to help make your dreams come true. We are here on Sundays at 7 a.m. and 7 p.m., Monday mornings at 1 a.m., Wednesdays at 9 a.m. for our special edition of Tell Me Your Story. We podcast on SoundCloud, iTunes, TuneIn Radio, Spotify, Stitcher, Player FM, Blueberry, iHeartRadio, Amazon Music, and many other locations on the Internet. And as I said before, we are also on YouTube. I hope you'll select notification on both of those platforms or any one of those platforms so that every time a new conversation is posted, you'll be notified. And um, as I said before, we are also on Facebook now. And uh, let's see what else. Oh, if you'd like to support the work that we are doing financially, we would be gratefully appreciative of that. Uh, we have a PayPal account. It's there for your security as well as ours. When you go to PayPal, they're going to ask you for an email address to whom to send this contribution. Richard at RichardDugan.com is the email address. Richard at RichardDugan.com. And we also ask that you spend time during this, the decade of perfect vision, going within and listening to that still small voice. With that all being said, we now go to our final three questions for our guest. And the first of those questions is, who is Amy Robeson? Who am I? I am I am. <laughs> I am the person who I am seeking to be, no matter where I'm at in this moment in time. Um, I am a mother. I'm a daughter. I am a wife. I am what I identify with. And I am what I am identifying with wanting to become uh, and I am conscious. What is your life's purpose? My life purpose is finding joy and embodying happiness and love and peace and assisting people in doing the same. And finally, what was your best day? Ah, there's so many. I'm going to say my best day was the day I was born, because otherwise I wouldn't have been able to have any of the other days. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you again for uh, being on the program and for sharing your time with us. And we look forward to talking with you again in the near future, uh, more about uh, your the Akashic Records and um, and uh, maybe even uh, tapping in and, and uh, sharing a yeah, little I'd bit love to of, do a reading for you on air sometime if that's something you're interested in I, doing. Absolutely. I'm absolutely interested in it. No question. So maybe yeah. that will be the impetus of our, our next conversation. I'd love to do that. Thank you. And if anybody wants to go to my website, we have free gifts. We have over 20 plus free healings that are all done through the Akashic Records. So if you're wanting to experience the Akashic Records through a healing, we have that on my website. Oh, I'd love to do that. I'll have to go on the website then. Oh, and that website, folks, theamyrobison.com. Well, once again, we come to the end of another edition of Tell Me Your Story, New Paradigms for a New World, where we are giving you choices and knowledge of those choices to help make your dreams come true. And until our next broadcast, podcast, video cast, love to Lal, Jeanette, I am listening, and Dad, be happy. <laughs>